are here in week six. Week six. So pay God a better way to pray. So this is week six. Um, we're flying through it at breakneck speed. And again, if you have missed any of these, uh, they're all on social medias of sort. They're on our website, YouTube channel, and podcast. If you're into any one of those, check them out if you missed any. And uh, we're just going to, that's, that's a little um, commercial. So we're going to get into it this morning. We're going to have some similarities from, to last week, uh, but uh, hope we all learned something today about prayer. So let's get started right away in 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. So, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. I know we're starting out with a really long verse here. I hope you can make it through. All right, it says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So, as I was reading this, I just thought, you know, we, we opened up in our first few weeks with the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked Jesus to pray. So, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, right in this verse it says that um, it's his, this is his, his will. Uh, what we read in the first part of the verse, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. All these, this opening statement on prayer and who we need to be praying for and, and that he desires for us to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. But the end of this verse there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So if you don't know what mediator means, I, I think we probably all do, right? But mediator is just a, someone who stands in between to reconcile in peace two opposing parties that have a, a dispute. So two great examples of mediators in like the Old Testament, and how many know we're in the New Covenant, right? That was cut in Jesus' blood. So, but the Old Testament, there was a different thing going on prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. So it was the Old Covenant, and there was the Abrahamic Covenant, there was a the Mosaic Covenant. So Abraham, how many members when, when Abraham, uh, back in the Old Testament, there was a Sodom and Gomorrah situation going on, right? And how many knows that it was, it, it was interesting the first time I, I read it, and I thought, well, that's interesting. He's trying to negotiate with God. So he was... God told Abraham, he, he was a friend of God, Abraham was. He was called the friend of God. And God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, just the level of sin and wickedness in that place. And how, you know, prior to Jesus' death, his, we're going to get into that a little bit more, but sin was like this cancer that had no cure, right? And it was spreading, and he had to, he had to deal with sin in a different way than it was dealt with in Christ Jesus. So Abraham came to God, and he's like, you're not... He's like, you, you wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for like, if there was 50 righteous people, would you? And God's like, no, I, w- I wouldn't do that. So he talked him all the way down to like 10. And uh, come to find out there was one, and it was Lot. And so Lot and his family were spared from the destruction of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. So in this account, Abraham was a mediator between God and Sodom and Gomorrah. So he was, you know, it was interesting that isn't that, that's a neat God. That's it's interesting because some people don't really believe that for for what it really was that God was. You, you could move him a little bit, like you could. Hey, let's have a conversation versus just tell me what you're doing. And the same goes for Moses. How many remember Moses was on the, on the mountain and he came down uh, with the stone tablets and God's like, hey. Your, I think he referred to them as your people. God referred to the Israelites going a little nutso. Nut so, uh, you know, the golden calf, that whole thing. Moses up there a little too long. Crazy stuff happened. And he's like, God, whoa. He's like, you're going you're gonna to tarnish your reputation 
he, God wanted to destroy the Israelites and start over with Moses. That's basically, in a nutshell, what, what was going on right in this moment. Like he had, like this is not good. And Moses is like, whoa God, just take pause. This is me, of course, paraphrasing. But he, he actually told God, you need to repent of the way you're thinking right now. And what nerve. But this is a different covenant. This was a different time. And this is this, Moses and God were were pretty close, and uh, Moses talked God out of doing what he was wanting to do with these Israelites that were completely freaked out, making a golden calf, worshiping it. So he came down, and he spared. You know, the Israelites were spared. He's like, you're going to tarnish your reputation. You you want people to be talking about you? You brought them out of the land of Egypt just to kill them in the mountains. Like you know, that's that's not a good story. So. That was the, that was, those were two accounts of mediators in the Old Testament. Well, in this, in this verse, we see that Jesus is the mediator. He is in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, Jesus is the mediator. And uh, he is, how many knows, he's the perfect mediator. So, there's some good news here. We're going to get into some, some different bits of good news this morning. And uh, that's, that's really what we want to proclaim here is good news, right? It's all about the gospel. But no more sin problem. What do you mean? I see sin everywhere. I turn on the TV and I see sin. Well, sin is no longer a problem with God because it has been atoned for through Jesus' finished work at the cross. And that's, that's one of the, the beautiful pictures of Jesus as the mediator between God and man now. He took all of the sin, right? For all of the world, all time, past, present, future, in himself. So God is not holding sin against the world. Right? That's, there's no longer a sin problem. It's a, there's a sinner problem, but that's an easy fix. Because the price has been paid and, the, and, and the, the war has been won. There's no more war against sin. It's been completed in Christ Jesus. And and sin can very much sin has its own wages, its own payment still. So there are consequences to sin, but God is not holding our sin, the sin of the world, against the world. E. W. Kenyon, there's there was no real good place to insert this this quote, but I just it's something that kind of stuck with me over the years. And sin in itself, E. W. Kenyon said. Sin makes cowards of men. That's something that sin does do. And it could, I, I mean, out of my own experience, just, you know, in, in my life, it, condemnation, fighting condemnation things, sin will bring you to a place where you feel condemned. You feel shame. You don't want to approach God in prayer. You, you think he's, I, I had parts of my life where I thought he was mad at me because of the sin that I couldn't shake or whatever it was. And it, it literally, that's why that kind of stuck with me. Like I experienced that. Sin makes cowards of men. But we are no longer slaves to sin. And that's the beauty is, is renewing our mind to the truth of the Word of God that Jesus has set us free from sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. Jesus bore the, the judgment for all sin, past, present, future, like I just said. And God's wrath towards sin was poured out on Jesus. And His justice, God's justice, was satisfied in Jesus through the Lamb of God, the Lamb's perfect sacrifice. So, I had mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. This just, I'll re restate it, that this in this moment, it's good to remind us that if God is, has not, holding our sin against us. So, linked to that is we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So, rather than having a sin conscience, always focused on your failure, shortcomings, God does not have a sin conscience when it comes to you. God actually, there's a, I hope I can re, um, I don't think I can get this verbatim, but it's one of the most glorious statements about grace. Grace is God's desire to be in relationship with you as though sin never 
existed. That's a picture of God's grace. A relationship with his children as though sin never existed. Because he doesn't see your sin. It's been done away with in Christ Jesus. And, and that's something I just would, you know, I can't emphasize enough. The beauty of the freedom of walking out a life, walking our journey in Christ, not having a consciousness, consciousness of sin. So there's a scripture in Romans, says, awake to righteousness, is it Romans? Awake to righteousness and sin not. So as you awaken to the righteousness of God, your, your position in Christ Jesus is righteous. As you awaken to that, sin will become a moot point. It's, it won't even be on your radar. And a pastor told me that years ago, and I didn't understand what he was talking about at the time, but I dug into it and I started living out and experiencing that kind of a life. The more I awakened, I just focused on the truth that I was made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I re- one day, it's almost like I woke up like, I'm not doing these things that I was in bondage or whatever it was. I was like there was a freedom being experienced without even trying. It was like an effortless change, effortless transformation. And that's really what it is. When, you, when we renew our mind, according to Romans 12, to, to the Word of God, we will see life transformation. And I saw that in that arena. Man, I really thought I was sticking to the script today. But uh, we're going off on rabbit trails. So, um, so we can't add, right? Nor would we need to, to, what, to anything Jesus did in his finished work, right? We can't add to it. It's actually, if you try to add to it, if you try to be the mediator, like in the Old Testament, like Moses was and Abraham was, and you're like, God, do not pour out your wrath on her. If that's ever had a, like you have a kid that's gone bonkers or whatever, and you're crying out to God, don't rain down your judgment on my kid who's doing crazy. Like you're actually, you're doing things that are anti-Christ. You're fighting against Jesus' finished work. You're trying to add to, like, we all, I hope we all believe that Jesus did a really good job. <laughs> like, it was, it was more than enough. He was, he was an overpayment for sin. I used to think at one time in my life that he would not pay. I used to actually preach this, which sounds, I don't, even, I don't think it's preaching. That's bad news. But that he would not pay one half a penny more than he had to for this world. But no, he was a gross overpayment. It's like if somebody, you know, owed a hundred dollars to somebody else and, and a guy rolled up and wrote a billion dollar check, keep the change. Like, you know, that's that pales in comparison to Jesus uh, finished work. But yeah, so Jesus plus you've probably heard this before, but Jesus plus anything equals nothing. We cannot add one thing to what he did at the cross. And, and then Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So and that's a great little thing to remember that you cannot add. Because I've we've we probably all do it without thinking or have done it without thinking, try to add to what Jesus did at the cross and his accomplished work. And and really, in that scripture in Hebrews where it talk, tells us it encourages us to labor to enter into his rest. Just resting in his finished work is is a great thing to do. <laughs> and and you need Holy Spirit's help with that, right? So speaking of Jesus, this will be the question for this is the question for people. If they were to stand before God, this could be a question. It's not did you do this, that, or the other bad thing? It's what have you done with Jesus? That's the one the big question for everyone. The answer to the question determines whether a person spends eternity in heaven or hell. Really, when it comes down to it. And this is the only sin. If if you're in a trivia game and this question comes up, here's your answer. What's the one sin that will keep you from heaven? Well, it's rejecting Jesus. That's it. It's not murdering people. It's not all the stuff. It's, it's not name a sin, any sin. It's rejecting Jesus that will keep you from entering the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You know, hell, hell was 
We know that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, not mankind. It was not designed for, for mankind. So when people reject Jesus' perfect sacrifice, they are identifying with the devil and will receive his judgment. I heard one person say that you will receive the judgment of your Lord. Well, I want what Jesus got. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And I know Jesus is your Lord. But you will receive the judgment of, everyone will receive the judgment of their Lord. And if, if they, obviously if they reject Jesus, they've chosen their Lord. And so they're, it's, it's really, you're rejecting the only payment for sin. And I know this is kind of elementary information, but um, it's real. And, and maybe you'll re- be reminded of this and you'll be able to share it with somebody who thinks that, that they're uh, too far gone or, or God's done with them or angry at them. And maybe take, it, take advantage of that moment and remind them the only thing keeping you from being adopted in the family of God is rejecting Jesus. So just embrace Him because He's already embraced you. Amen? So it's good, good news. And and if people knew how easy it was and how good it was, I don't think they could turn it down. It's too good to turn down. So, But everyone must believe uh, for themselves, right? And, And so that just reiterates, let's keep preaching the gospel, which preaching just means to proclaim. Proclaim good news. I mean, I, I, I went to Cedar Point with my kids on Thursday. 54 at Cedar Point is way different than 34. But, yeah. But, you know, just in the last few days, there was a coaster I had never ridden. It was like the greatest thing I've ever ridden. And I was proclaiming the good news of that coaster. <laughs> when, you, when you're excited about something, it just comes out. So, you know, one of those, that's a poor example. But So, when you're excited about something, though, don't keep it inside. I mean, we don't do it in just in life in general and stuff that really doesn't matter, right? So how much more the good news of Jesus and, and that He's not God's not mad at, at people, right? Second Corinthians 5.18 says, God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. So we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And uh, say, be reconciled to God and Even in Colossians, the first chapter of Colossians, it talks about how Jesus reconciled, God reconciled the world through Jesus. Some some translations say set back into harmony. And that's beautiful. That he's not holding sin against people because it was judged in Christ Jesus. And, And again, I know I'm preaching like Gospel 101, but it's so good. And so last week, um, we're going to see a different uh, angle on this with another parable Jesus said. But last week, um, Pastor Chad went over Luke eleven five through 8 and uh, a parable about the friend that showed up late, late at night, right? Because he had a friend show up at his house and he's like, hey, can I borrow three lo- loaves of bread? And, uh, and this, this talked about this friend that he was trying to borrow food from in the middle of the night. He's like, I'm in bed, my family's in bed. Stop bugging me, but because the guy was persistent, like all right, he gave in and all that stuff. And it was it wasn't a comparison. People people use that as a as a comparison. Um, they teach it as a prayer of importunity. Importunity and prayer is like a constant, insistent demanding. And it was a contrast. It was a it's a contrasting parable Jesus was giving of how people think about God. And pe- unfortunately, people teach that, yeah, that's, that's how God is. You've got to shake his house down to get him to respond. You've got to bang on the door all night long. And hopefully, his answer will be yes eventually. But there was a contrast there. And, and if you go back next to the last week's and listen to that, and you'll get, get what I'm saying. But there's another contrasting uh, parable we're going to get into um, so let's look at that uh, right now. And people use this to teach uh, importunity and prayer. That same kind of idea that God's like, you got to really pry his hands open with that spiritual crowbar. So Luke 18, 1 through 3, it says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they, would, they, they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city. He said, 
who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. So right off the bat, the statement, the description, neither feared God nor cared about people, that should be a strong indicator that this is contrasting. <laughs> because that's, but people teach that God's like this. But it's, the answer in there is, this isn't like God. But we're going to keep on going. So it's a major contrast, not a comparison. So let's, let's go on to verse 4 and 5. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. Again, what the heck? This is a contrast. But this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. So she was nagging this judge. This judge that she knew, she didn't, she didn't care about God, didn't care about people. He was, he was a big jerk face, probably, right? So some people teach that God is just like this unjust judge uh, who, you know, like, who isn't known to answer. It's like, what, why isn't he listening? We've got we to gotta really get his attention here and, and bug, the, bug the heck out of him. So you've got to wear him down, right? That's, that's, the, that's the idea of this unjust judge. Let's, let's jump forward to, to verse 6 and 7. It says, Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. So Jesus is very clear with, this is an unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Drum roll. Here's the answer. Verse 8. I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find in the earth who have faith? So, God is nothing like this unjust judge. He is quick with justice. And it's, the problem isn't his willingness to give. It comes down to our ability to receive, to believe and receive that he is a good, good Father. He is a good, good God. I think that's a major hang-up in our life. And we can so easily in our mind disqualify ourselves. And trust me, you know, the devil knows our weak points, right? He knows what's worked before. He ain't got no new bag of tricks. So he's going to keep trying to use the same trick, right? So for me, it's, you know, uh, there's a, a performance thing, you know, in my head, through my life, whatever. And I, it's a, it takes an intentional Stop and think about this before you go down that road of I'm not, you know, whether it's an I'm not worthy thought or I did this, so I've disappointed God. All this junk that, you know, I'm speaking for myself. I know you guys don't deal with stuff like this. But, you know, fighting those thoughts of, of, of whether it's shame or shortcoming or, or whatever it is, con condemning thoughts, you have to stop thinking that way. And you just believe what he said is true. And that's what the big hang-up is, is. He is, you know how much more God wants you to receive every benefit, every, every promise of God in Christ is yes and amen. Amen. He wants you to have it more and receive it and, and, and live in it more than you want to. And we have that belief and receive issue a lot of times. That this is too good to believe or this is, is this really for me type thing? But he wants you to walk in it and experience that, that life in Christ um, and that victory in Christ. So the illustration of earthly fathers and mothers, again, I, I use that illustration so much, but how much more, like, I mean, I don't think this is a good illustration, but my daughter, she, like, I heard I was on the couch yesterday reading, and she's like, ah, a mouse, a mouse. I didn't think my... Boys could get that high, but she screamed, a mouse. And I was like, that's an injustice. Like, I'm thinking, there's a stupid mouse in the house. So I went immediately to Meyer and I bought mouse traps. And I, I brought justice into my home. I was swift with justice. That's a really weird example, isn't it? But when we got home last night after the Loons game, that mouse, he was messing. 
He was he looked like he was stunned. I think that the trap came down and he was like outside of the trap, but he was like, What just hit me? And then I got out the old uh, Red Rider BB gun and I let him know what just hit him. So <laughs> so but they're gonna edit that. They're gonna they're gonna shut this video down. Uh anyways. But justice in this verse is God is quick to bring justice for his children, for his loved ones. Just like just like a regular natural mom and dad would come to the rescue, come to the defense, come to avenge their children. You know, right? How much more we are in covenant with God through the blood of Jesus. We're all his favorites. Come on. He's gonna he's gonna make sure that that uh it's swift justice. So I believe it. I don't care what you believe, but I believe it. So <laughs> so believe, go, and do. We need to believe. So I just talked about this. We need to believe Jesus' finished work was enough. Right? We don't have to add anything to it. It was complete. And we can just rest in His finished work. We need to believe that God wants people saved. He says it in His Word. He would that none would be lost, but that all would come to repentance. God wants your loved ones to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ more than you do. He, you know, I people have said over over the years in different testimonies, like, you know, saying something so ludicrous and ridiculous, and I think they woke up after they said it, like, God, if you cared half as much about my loved ones as I do, they'd be saved by now. You know, something ridiculous like that. Oh yeah, I didn't give my son. I didn't give everything I had for those no, salvation. I'm sorry. You're. I'm sorry. I missed that. You know, and uh, God wouldn't talk like that. But that's people have have prayed that thing. God, if you love my so and so half as much as I do, they would be healed. They would be delivered from this sickness or disease. Well, did you happen to look back at my son who took stripes on his back for that? You know, he didn't. He didn't miss he didn't crossing every T, dotting every I. So we need to believe that, that God wants to see people saved. He wants them delivered. He wants them walking in divine health more than, than we do. And uh, the reason uh, you want these things is because He put the desire in you. Did you know that? We, we know that verse that the love of God, the compassion, we see Jesus constantly moved with compassion as He walked on the earth. He was moved with compassion. And we saw the result of that, the fruit of that, and the healing and the deliverances and, and the miracles. His heart of compassion has been placed in us in Christ Jesus. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by Holy Spirit. And there's a beautiful verse in Philippians 2.13. 2, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. So God is at work in you. If you have an inkling of anything in you that's kind of like your heart's going out to somebody, whether it's, you know, they're just down and out, depressed, uh, they're, they're being attacked with sickness and disease, they just, you just know, they need to know Jesus is the answer. If your heart is being drawn to that person or those people, it is God in you pouring out His love in you. And... Um, Take hold of that and ask Holy Spirit to help you to minister to that situation. God, is, God has released the power of His Spirit and it's in all of us. The po- every, everything needed, I think Pastor Chad said this earlier, that everything needed is already in you, in Christ. Everything we're ever going to need in this life is already in us, in Christ Jesus. But we must release this power out to others. Right? So out of our belly will flow rivers of living water, the Word says. And as we believe His Word, as we go out and proclaim it, and be, we're doers of it, not just hearers, right? We just hear the Word, take it in, take it in. You know, as, 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 as certain bodies of water just take in water, but they don't give any out, it just stinks, right? It's a bog, it's a stench, right? So and He'll confirm His Word with signs following. So these are these are... It's not just for us just to get lost in a little prayer closet. I'm not saying you need to do that. But it's more about engaging the world and bringing the kingdom of God to this, to this world. 
And uh, it's been said that, you know, I think Pastor Chad opened up this series with this statement, and it kind of like stuck in me too, but sometimes we are the answer to our own prayers. So we have the same Holy Spirit, right, that raised Jesus from the dead. He, he's, he's living in us. We have all the power we'll ever need to get the job done, to get our assignment done, to get our ministry done. How many know, we just learned yesterday in the men's group, all you guys with families, you're the pastors of your home. You got your little flock. I mean, maybe your little flock flew away. I don't know. But, but you are, we are the leaders of our home and we are well equipped with Holy Spirit to lead and, 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 and proclaim His goodness. Uh, we have the hands, right? Mark 16 says, these signs will follow them that believe. Part of that is they'll lay hands on the sick and, and they'll recover. So we have the hands, right, to lay on the sick to see them recover. And uh, we have the mouth to preach the gospel, to proclaim the good news, right? Proclaim liberty to the captives. We have we have resurrection power in the inside of us to release it into others. This has nothing to do with your feelings. Like I don't feel revved up inside with the resurrection life of God. Well, it's in your spirit, man. You're just like Jesus in your spirit. We've said that over and over here in, in the past, and uh, we have resurrection life in us that God wants to see released through us into people who are in need of it. I don't care if you're born again for one minute. You have the resurrection life of God in you just as a person who's been born again for 50 years. That same Spirit, there's no baby Holy Spirit that grows up in you over time. It's the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in you one minute after you're born again or 50 years after you're born again. And I, you know, unfortunately, it's probably the longer you're born again, the more you don't, you forget that the spirit, the resurrection life of God's in you, and you can just go through the motions. But His life is in you to be released through you into this world to bring the kingdom everywhere. And um, and that's. The You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.